Our keynote speaker this morning is from MIT, and I am extremely excited to hear what he's got to say this morning. Um, Michael Schrage appears at the Digital Health Assembly Open Innovation Conference in association with the Welsh Government's membership of MIT's Industrial Liaison Programme. Um, those of you who have not got involved with that program, I can highly recommend it. Um, I spent a, a good week in Boston myself in October, and um, it really is a, uh, a competitive advantage for the companies in Wales who have an opportunity to, uh, to go on that course. Um, and their sponsorship has allowed Michael to, uh, to appear at the conference today. So I'd like to welcome into the stage, Michael Sharj. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who f are following the weather, you will, you will know that I, I am, this is my first time in, in Cardiff. I am so much happier to be here than in Boston right now. I believe that we have passed the uh, five foot mark in snow for the month of January. So I will cheerfully exchange the, the slate, gray, uh, uh, slate gray sky of, of uh, Cardiff for, for uh, five feet of snow in, in, in Cambridge. It's a genuine pleasure to be here for the first time. I very much appreciate this opportunity, and I also appreciate the timing of this kind of, a, of an event. <clears throat> I think the organizers and the, the sponsors have got it spot on. The open innovation issue, the transparency issue, the informatics issue, this is the right time to be having serious design conversations, serious principle conversations about what we want to do to align our processes, our people, and our technologies to deliver better healthcare outcomes. With that said, I have to offer both a disclaimer and a confession. The disclaimer is, I'm, a, I'm an innovation guy. I'm not a medical person. I'm not a healthcare person. I've had a lot of experience, good and bad, with healthcare systems all over the world. I work with a variety of organizations that seek to become more innovative, some deliverers, some medical devices and diagnostics, but it is not my area of expertise. My confession is, when I was asked by the ILP, the Industrial Liaison Program, to participate here, um, I had a, you know, I just finished a book, I had an immediate notion of how I would repurpose my book and present it here. Uh, in the course of trying to make this a more bespoke and relevant talk, I went in a completely different direction. So this is really going to be a bit different than what I had expected. And so it's not exactly a beta talk, but I'm going to be very interested in your reactions to it. But this is really my most important slide. The content of the audience is more important than the content of the talk. I'm very, very interested in your reaction to this quite frankly, uh, uh, edgy and harsh sense, design sensibility and point of view. Uh, the more I spent time refining my thoughts, the more committed I've become to communicating this core message. And so I know there's no Q&A at the end of this talk, but I, at the panel sessions that follow and in the break, I very much look forward to interacting. Now, there's a certain bias if you're at MIT that everybody expects you to celebrate the virtues of technology and innovation. Literally last week, I read of this smartphone dongle for infectious diseases at the point of care. Literally last week, you have your smartphone, it's, a, it's an attachment, and it turns your mobile phone, whether it's iOS or Android, into a, a medical diagnostics tool that is probably superior to the overwhelming majority of things that existed a, a, a decade ago. I mean, it's absolutely remarkable what's going on. And I am absolutely not here to talk about how remarkable technological innovation is in the healthcare space. You know that, we know that. That's not the issue. The issue is how do you get value from it in a cost-effective, implementable, real-world way as opposed to an idealistic way. So, with that in mind, I'd like to do what all keynote speakers do, the obligatory profound quote. I feel particularly comfortable doing this here in Wales because it's a mining quote. 
I'm a little uncomfortable doing it because it's a quote from a Frenchman, but such is life. Um, this is Monsieur Le Play. He was one of the first of the industrial sociologists. He was the superintendent of the Ecole des Mines, the school of mines in the era when, of course, the bulk of Europe's wealth came from the extractive industries. And Monsieur Le Play, as a, as a mining supervisor, as the head of a school, a professional school in Ecole in, 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 in France, says, you know, the most important product of the mines is the miner. It's the miner. It's not the coal. It's not the metal. It's not the tin. If you really look at how mines create value, and I'm not doing a Marxist labor theory of value here, it's the human capital in the system that really is what's transformative. You're welcome to agree or disagree. I found this an extraordinarily important perception, up to and including the point that I want to bring it into the 21st century and argue the most important product of the network is not the bits and bytes and video that's carried on the networks. It's the networker, the way your devices, the way your, your tablets, the way your mobile phones have transformed you. They've changed who you are and what you are capable of doing if you so choose. The most important product of the network is the networker, which means, which means the kinds of networks we design and build should reflect and respect the kinds of people we want our networkers to become, whether there are patients, our staff, our innovators, this to me, <clears throat> to me, is at the core of what open innovation is all about. What kind of networkers do we want our healthware, healthcare networks to create? Not just the healthcare outcomes, what kind of people are we looking for all of this technology and innovation to create? The purpose of innovation is not innovation. Innovation is a means to an end. What are the ends we seek? And my point here is the human capital ends are inextricably entwined with the better healthcare outcome ends. And this did, is reflected in a book that I wrote for the Harvard Business Press. Who do you want your customers to become? Innovation is not just an exchange of value. Innovation, particularly in healthcare, is an investment in the human capital capabilities and competencies of your customers and clients, and indeed, even of your patients. Okay? So with that in mind, I want to briefly tell a tale of two networks. One is a modest, global success that originated here in Wales, unexpectedly. The other is an enormous, and in my opinion, embarrassing and humiliating failure originating in the United States by somebody you never would have thought would fail. So let's begin here. Arch Cochran. If there's nothing else I'm going to be grateful for, it's that in the course of doing due diligence, because you always try to do something to localize a talk, that I came across this character, a Scot who came to, to Cardiff. What a fascinating guy. He got MBE, OBE, took care of, uh, he was captured uh, uh, by the Germans in World War II and ended up being the medical officer in, in, in the camps, to, taking care of uh, uh, prisoners of war. And, and Mr. Cochran, Dr. Cochran, uh, uh, by the way, one of the first students of Theodore Reich, uh, psychoanalysis and Theodore Reich in Vienna. Just really, really, really interesting, interesting guy. And he was a pioneer, beginning in the 1940s and 50s, of randomized clinical trials, which evolved, this is the classic article that he did, which evolved, they just rebranded themselves, which evolved into the Cochrane Collaborative. 
of over 34,000 people, a global network of people who collect and review and publish insights into randomized clinical trials. It's, it's, it, it, it's not headquartered here in, in Wales. It was taken over by somebody in Oxford, but it was dedicated to, to Cochrane's influence and his, and his memory. Very, very, you know, not, not extraordinarily well known outside the medical community, but very, very successful. And what makes it more successful? The ability to use technology as a medium to exchange information, reviews, et cetera. A, a, a model of a bottom-up global influence innovation. Modest success, and now for the tremendous failure. Who doesn't know Google? Google is the new GE, Google everywhere. The Economist does their cover stories on this. The EU is investigating them and will, will do their best to, to bust it up in some sort of way. Google hires fantastic students and faculty from MIT. They do terrific work in, in uh, all manner of technology. My, my goodness, they turn, they turn contact lenses into diagnostic platforms and they can network them on top of this. And in the year 2008, as America was going through the turmoil of one of the most ill-conceived massive pieces of comprehensive reform, by the way, my advice to you as an American, when anybody preaches to you about comprehensive reform, run to the hills. Run to the hills. Uh, but that's a conversation for later. So Google launched Google Health. Huge market. Everybody knew electronic records management was the way to go. Predictive analytics. What company in the world was better able to take advantage of a fundamental, forgive the use of this word, don't hiss, paradigm shift in healthcare than Google? They've got the networks, they've got the people, they've got the talent, they understand the evidence base. The evidence base. They've, they've, they've got everything, okay? Launch 2008. Everybody wanted to become involved. Less than four years later, it's dead. They fail. Huge, it's, this is not on the margins thing. There is no bigger business in America than healthcare. The best, quote unquote, IT company, search company, information, failed in the biggest markets. They don't talk about it much now. Big, big failure. Why did they fail? For the same reason that the Cochrane Collaborative succeeded. The secret sauce is network effects. Google Health was about managing patient information. Cochrane Collaborative was about creating a network and scaling the network. The secret sauce that I urge you to mix into your policy, proposals, plans, pilots, prototypes is network effects. What is the definition of a network effect? What is this web 2.0 thing that this gentleman, Tim O'Reilly, who coined the phrase, describes it? The service automatically gets better the more people use it. More in both meanings of the phrase. More as in quantity of people, more as in quantity of use. It was designed to get better the more people use it. Google 2.0, for whatever stupid reason, and these are smart people, for whatever stupid reason Google did it, there was no baked in network effects for Google Health. And what network effects means is the traditional, and I'm an econ computer science guy, economics computer science guy, the traditional notion of diminishing returns goes away. Network effects is the anti-diminishing returns. You're explicitly designing something not with the notion of marginal revenue equals marginal costs, but that the more people use it, you're gonna get better quantity and quality. And I won't read the, the entire thing to you, 
but this is the real definition. Unless your enterprise, unless your process, unless your product, unless your healthcare service doesn't get better the more people use it, you are making a design error. You are making a design error. The whole notion of a web 2.0 environment, which is so effectively and successfully disruptive in business models and industries around the world and in verticals around the world, whether it's legal or media or advertising, is the, you want to design it so that you can harness the benefits of the collective intelligence that emerges as a result. Collective intelligence emerges as an organizing principle for design for how you get value from network effects. And the simplest and my favorite example of this is recommendation engines. My heuristic, as somebody who teaches executive education, as somebody who does advisory work, I have a simple heuristic for whether organizations grok, understand, appreciate, get what network effects means. Particularly, particularly organizations of scale. And that's, do they have a recommendation engine capability? If your organization, if you've got more than 1,000 people in your organization and or you serve more than 20,000 people and you don't have customers, clients, and you don't have a recommendation engine, you're doing something wrong. You're doing something wrong because you're not making what is now a relatively cheap investment in network effects. All healthcare systems, public, private, all of them should have recommendation engines. All of them. You put me on a government advisory committee for procurement, I'm going to say when there's a proposal, I'm going to say, great, how does it incorporate into a recommender? How come Google does a, uh, how come Amazon does a better job of making recommendations than your healthcare provider? Shame on us. In technical terms, this is the, what's called a two-sided market. And, and you want to begin thinking of the healthcare service providers, the platform here. You have one side, same side network effects. The more customers use it, the more appealing it becomes. But at the, the same time, in the de developers, the more customers we have, the more incentive we have to develop. What's the classic model of this? The Apple Store. The more users there are of the iPhone, the more developers there are, they compete against each other, et cetera. This is how you create a virtuous cycle of network effects. And what it leads to is the notion of what kind of architectures do we have of participation through recommendations and social media uh, uh, and the apps that the, the minister was referring to earlier. These are the kinds of things that we need to talk about in a healthcare context. We have to move away, move away from the telemedicine notion of how do we have one person use, or one group use a network as a substitute for physical presence. We have to move away from telemedicine as a substitution phenomenon and more towards, no. How do we use telemedicine to create network effects? that the more people use it, the better it becomes. And you get the economies and efficiencies of scale, as well as, and this will come in a moment, the analytics. How about this for a business model analytic effect? You've all heard of Kickstarter. Why don't we have Kickstarters inside the enterprise and out for healthcare providers and, 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 and people helping people, caretakers in this regard? What would get funded in a public-private context in this regard? One of the finest examples of a network effects origin that happened by accident, and I, if you haven't heard of this fellow, and if you're not familiar with it, I urge you just to check it out. It's going to be, that's the great thing about the web. You know, the, the, the cost and a, a challenge of doing due diligence on anything I say, it's fairly easy to manage these days. Here's an MIT guy, Salman Khan, Khan Academy. Show of hands, heard, heard of it? Excellent, excellent. It began out of a, out of, long story short, um, this Sri Lankan 
uh, uh, used to be Ceylon, Sri Lankan MIT guy was tutoring his niece, and he couldn't do real-time stuff anymore, so he began recording his tutoring sessions on YouTube, and his niece told him that actually she would rather watch his video than deal with him in live. And the niece began sharing the video with some of her friends and making contributions, and it scaled into Khan Academy, which has been funded by Bill Gates, had an enormous impact. YouTube videos, and now there are assessment issues. Why don't our healthcare systems have Khan Academies? for how you do compliance, adherence, or take care of people. Why don't we invest in our patients and the people who take care of our patients in that regard? That's an emergent network effect. There's plenty of precedents to beg, borrow, and steal from that are not capital and cost or even time intensive. So what's my open network thrust and takeaway here? I urge you to think and rethink and challenge each other about what it means to design and align network effects to better attain better healthcare outcomes. That's where the economies and efficiencies and opportunities are. With my tongue only partly in my cheek, I believe every organization should have Every healthcare organization should have a CNEO, a Chief Network Effects Officer. Failing that, let's have a Network Effects Operating Committee, which encourages coordination, collaboration, and consultation around opportunities for network effects. We'll talk about how you manage that technically in a moment. But as the Vice Minister was saying, or Assistant Minister was saying, there's an issue of our, 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 our we're going to talk about the four A's here for doing this, for our ingredients. What are the apps? What are the APIs, the application programming interfaces, which will be the Schwerpunkt, the real focus of the talk? What about the, the, the analytics? And basically, how do they combine into the architectures? That's it. That's it. That's your taxonomy. That's your framework that every single session the big data session, the empowering uh, 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 patients and staff session, and the business model session all embrace. These are the pillars and opportunities here. Everybody is familiar with apps, and they represent a fundamental shift in perception. Because what do apps ask their users to do? Keep Do it yourself. Apps are DIY. You are endowing or imposing upon the user of an app the ability and sometimes even the obligation to do something, to learn something, to study something, to accomplish something. One of, to me, one of the most important trends that's going on in personal health and healthcare and fitness is the quantitative self. People have their Fitbits, people have their Nike fuel bands. There is an app now where you can take a picture of the food you're eating and it will spit back by text how many calories and the nutritional composition of that. It's a free service. Uh, those of you concerned about your privacy, be a little bit concerned about that one, but still, it's a very interesting app. The whole notion of the quantified self and what we can learn from that is a fascinating one. For people in care, for people taking care of people, to have insight, measurable insight, is a big deal. It is a big deal. It is, I think, transformative. It is an investment in human capital capabilities and competencies. But they're more provocative. As I mentioned the, the, the modular phone in the beginning. How many people here use Shazam? This is the, I got to tell you. This is the highest proportion for people over the age of 30 that I've seen using, using Shazam. Okay? It's remarkable. Well, how tough is it to have a medical Shazam? You cough. Pneumonia? Just a cough. What, it, what is it? What are ways of doing medical acoustic diagnostics via the phone? 
How expensive? This is where scale takes advantage. Network effects. Network effects. That's not science fiction. That's not science fiction. That's next week. How do you incorporate this? The mechanism, the organizing principle that enables these things, this is the secret sauce for network effects, is interoperability. Interoperability has to become, if not the, a key and core design principle, architectural principle going forward. Interoperability transforms the economics and opportunities for interdisciplinary cross-functional innovation. This is why, you know, in, in medicine we have translational medicine. I'm saying we've screwed ourselves by having disciplines and verticals where we seek to optimize the local function. Interoperability is not just our best opportunity for facilitating network effects. It's our best opportunity for reducing the coefficient of friction for collaboration and collective expertise. That is a big deal. It is a philosophical issue, not just a technical issue. The technical issue, when I was going in school, we didn't talk about interoperability. We talked about, what do, what do you do when you run a big system? Systems integration. How do you integrate the system? How do you make sure that things are tightly coupled? That made perfect sense for the day because you were optimizing all of these individual components and you had to make sure that they worked. And processing power was kind of slow and kind of expensive. The economics have switched. It's switched. It's cheaper now and more robust and resilient now to have interoperability than integration. But to, the, to this very day, I see RFPs where it says, we want tightly integrated systems. We want an integrated system. Give us an integrated system. Integrated healthcare. No. Screw integration. Invest in interoperability. And I just want to clarify this. Interoperability is not just interconnectivity. Interconnectivity is a necessary but not sufficient condition for interoperability. It's not how do these things talk to one another. Talking is not enough. It's not enough. And this is one of the legacy informatics issue where the exchange of information, making sure they're in the right format or standards, not enough. It's a Procrustean bed. We need to think away from not just how do we have integrated components to interoperable devices. And in the context of this morning's conversation, interoperability is going to mean the ability to provide and accept digitally enabled services. Everybody in this room has heard of and is probably sick unto death of the Internet of Things. But the Internet of Things is not about internet connection. It's about interoperability. We're talking about not just Apple Watches or medical Shazams. We are talking about things, do you plug it into... You, 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 do you plug your pill box into your mobile phone? Heck, do you turn your mobile phone into a pill box? And then breathe onto the sensor to make sure that the dosage was appropriate. Or an hour later, you get a, a little beep to remind you to breathe into the sensor to see how well the pharmacological, pharmaco, pharmacokinetics are going. What is the mechanism that enables this kind of interoperability? The design of the API, applications programming interfaces. APIs specify how software components interact with each other, not exchange information, interact. The goal of an API is to provide self-service, one-to-many, reusable interfaces. They are the hinges of interoperability. And we've seen companies like uh, Microsoft and Intel buy API companies. Again, I don't need to explain all, read these things to you, but the point is that it's in so many fundamental technological transformations that's occurring. What used to be a back office back office boffin function, backroom boy function, 
is now point of touch for both the customer and the designer. The API has become an integral part of the user experience, which means it has to become an integral part of the healthcare experience. We already see in America public, because I know this is a public-private thing, we have the PMP media standards, public media platform, where America's publicly funded media publish API. So editorial material, videos, audios can be freely mashed up and exchanged. The, the, this is the role that government and foundation should play, to convene, to have APIs. We're not telling people what to do. We're not saying you need to do this, you need to do that. We just want to make sure that people can write to each other's content and capabilities and create services, mash up services for these things. What's the company that's done a fantastic job of this? This is an, actually a very interesting memo, and for the slightly, because you don't really need to be technically inclined, just slightly technically inclined. This is a guy, Steve Yegi, who went from Google to Amazon, and this sort of ties back into the Google Health point. Amazon does everything internally and externally around APIs. Everything you do, doesn't matter the technology, you have an API. They must communicate, through, teams must communicate through those interfaces. Why do we, I mean, uh, we should be, uh, uh, this is a slight overstatement, so forgive me, a bit of hyperbole, but we should be ashamed that we have to look to Amazon, which sells books and consumer goods for inspiration on how we have innovation teams communicate with each other in healthcare. Again, this is not a hypothetical. It's, it's not that delivering healthcare is more complex than the logistics that they're running. Yes, there are other complexities associated with it, but the nature of how APIs can be used to facilitate the design of services and interactions is not. The precedent is there. And so different kinds of services can easily emerge, not by edict from the top down, but from the bottom up and the middle up through the ingenuity of individuals and small teams. And since it's not just information, we're moving from an era, era of mashups to what I'm calling mechups. Everybody's going to be having these kinds of devices. Informatics is going to be as much, not just about predictive analytics, it's going to be about enabling devices and people to do a better job of delivering service at the point of care. Actions, not just data. And again, we see real world models of this. GitHub as repositories for code. I think we're going to see repositories for APIs and healthcare and health services that are reusable and useful and can build upon one another. Not just in the data in informatics sense, but from my colleague, is, you, know, you know, Arduino, but in the device sense. We will have APIs for kits, medical kits and devices, much as we do for databases and RCTs. And they'll be able to write to each other. We will have opportunities for combinatorial innovation. And my colleague at MIT, who you should really have speak here, Jose Gomez Marquez, who runs the D-Lab, the design lab in, in, in healthcare at, at MIT. Um, you know, when he reviews stuff, innovators are not even in the first place. What's one of my measure, suggested measures of effectiveness for the initiatives you say? When you attract unexpected, serendipitous innovation and in innovators. Of course we want our doctors and our nurses to be innovating. Of course we want our medical device companies to become more innovative. How do you know that you've designed a good innovation ecosystem? When you have people you never would have expected making contributions, making contributions that makes everybody say, oh my gosh, that, how is that possible? You know how it's possible? Because you made an investment in interoperability and, and network effects. And just so I can underscore this, I'm gonna quote a Nobel laureate economist, Ronald Coase, who came from the UK to, to the University of Chicago, the area where I grew up. What's traded is not physical entities, but the rights to perform certain actions. That's where governance matters. 
interrupt. The role of the people in this room is not just going to have the APIs, but what are the rights and responsibilities and rules associated with that? And I joke that this is the next IP. Interoperability permissions matters so much more in healthcare than any other field. This is the argument and conversation that you're going to have to be having. You're going to have to be having it. Now, because I'm in Wales and because of your traditions, some of the traditions that I've been exposed to, I will, again, tongue more firmly in cheek, quote somebody I know that many people in Wales admired for many years, Trotsky. You may not be interested in interoperability, but interoperability is interested in you. Forgive me, now I'll be the arrogant American. Doesn't matter what the people in this room do. This is what's going on in the rest of the world. This is what's going on. We've moved from control to influence through the quality of APIs and the architectures they enable. And of course, all the information that's generated creates petabytes of opportunity for analytics both for the efficacy of the systems themselves and for healthcare. But I'll leave that to the big data group. But what I want you to come away with is how do we make it easier for our constituents to participate and create connections they see as valuable? How do we make it easier for ourselves to identify value? How do we, as we get more and more data and APIs, how do we reorganize ourselves to take advantage of this? and HX's healthcare experience. These are the questions we need to ask ourselves going forward. Or if I can put it in this kind of a schematic, how do we create a virtuous cycle of APIs, apps, and analytics? New analytics suggest new APIs. New APIs enable new apps. New apps generate app, new, new analytic opportunities and perhaps API tweaks and adjustments. If you'll forgive me going meta, how do we create network effects around network effects? I think those are the questions that have to matter more over the next few years. I will say that, and I've been so many different part of these things, I, I am a little cynic, cynical in one regard, which is I, I've become less optimistic about strategy and more concerned about cultural issues. Yes, designing for network effects and the interoperability that enables them requires cultural shift and change. It's going to require a cultural sensibility shift. And I hope that we change or alter or modify our recognition and reward systems to reinforce that opportunity. I also think we need to be cautious about, there's a wonderful phrase in the IT world and the internet world about, about um, permissionless innovation. You're welcome to Google it. From, that's the Internet Engineering Task Force. I don't want permissionless innovation <laughs> in healthcare. <laughs> I don't. So in the same way we talk about interoperability rights, what, do we, what does permission to innovate mean in the environment? And because I'm obligated to point out to the downside of this, I'd be scared crapless with a Stuxnet of, of a bit of malware going into an interoperable healthcare system environment. We do have to take those sorts of threats seriously. But I do think that, that the ethical environment is changing on this. It used to be we were very, very concerned about patient privacy, et cetera. I, I am frankly of the view that between things like gay marriage and openly worn prosthetics, that certain shame and awkwardness associated with being otherly abled or being unwell, a lot of that stigma has gone away. I think more people may be more inclined to share more information about things that previously were never discussed. But yes, as cliched as it is, we need to have the bioethicists at the table and we need to have the technical conversations about what meaningful aggregation, meaningful anonymization, and meaningful informed consent in a network's effects environment means. So I just want to, to 
get close to ending with this comment. The Hippocratic admonition was primum non nocera. First, do no harm. There's nothing that I've said in this talk which contradicts or violates that in any way, shape, or form. But I'm going to ask you to ask another question in my babblefish Latin. Who benefits from network effects? Who benefits from network effects? We need to take that design question seriously. So my call to action is, how do we align interoperability with network effects to attain desirable healthcare outcomes? I think the three tracks that follow for the rest of the day and for the rest of the event are beautifully designed to address precisely these concerns. I want to thank you so much for your time and attention. I look forward to interacting with you during the break and in the panels. That's my email if you have any questions or comments. All the best and have a wonderful conference. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, as the uh, founder and uh, CEO of a predictive analytics company, there wasn't a, a single thing that I heard there that I didn't enjoy. Um, I think uh, uh, the work that uh, David Ford's, uh, Professor Ford's team has done uh, on the sale database in Swansea is, uh, is a real move forward in the uh, ability to use interoperability and, and look across a range of data sets that previously just haven't been available to us. So um, I know we're going to be talking afterwards, yes. but you're going to be available yes. um, in the members' lounge. Um, now, if you'll excuse me, I'll be a little bit, uh, a little bit corny. I do, I do think that uh, innovation is a, is a contact sport, okay? So a little bit after, uh, uh, for about 40, 50 minutes after this uh, session, we're going to be going to the members' lounge. Um, it's a networking opportunity. Um, <clears throat> Uh, none of us are going to be able to move any of these agendas forward in the next uh, couple of days if we uh, talk to the people that we already know. So uh, if you can represent your own networks, um, uh, go into the members' lounge, perhaps speak to some people that you haven't spoken to before, um, and see if we can't move some of these agendas forward. Because I was very happy to read last week um, uh, in uh, the NHS in England, uh, people starting to refer to some of the innovation that we're doing around analytics as a as a moral obligation, and I really do believe that. I don't think that we're going to be able to carry on providing the services that we do at the moment unless we take a, uh, a much more ag aggressive look at the data that we have available to us and start prizing out some of the uh, innovation that's hiding in there for us to, uh, to improve the healthcare services that we have um, and to make better use of the, uh, the resources that are available to us. Um, I've been uh, asked to uh, mention uh, to you all that perhaps we can tweet as often as possible. Um, the hashtag is DHA2015, uh, and there's a uh, massive screen at the back there where you can read other people's comments. Um, we've got three tracks that will continue after the uh, networking break. Um, they are uh, the uh, Innovative Business Models track, um, Empowering Patients and Staff, and of uh, course my favorite, um, Big Data. Um, so thank you very much for your attention this morning, and uh, please go forth and make contact with your fellow conference-goer. Thank you very much. <laughs>